I know sensors, but you know, <laughs> all my stuff on uh, therapeutics and uh, was, might be a little bit unrelated. So I'm going to need your help in an interactive way to really uh, extract the maximum we can. Who identifies as uh, a scientist? Who, who, <laughs> who identifies as a clinician? That's the idea. Who's non-binary? <laughs> okay. You can, uh, you know, surf both sides of the break, okay? Um, so we're going to try and... and, and I, I came and listened to these previously and um, they were great. They work best if there's a lot of interaction and a lot of discussion. Uh, so I might ask dumb questions. I might, it might look like I'm picking on people, but I'm just trying to facilitate the discussion. And these things... Um, work best if you walk away from here thinking about one thing you never thought of before in a way you hadn't thought about it as possible, okay? So that's the objective. On that, I think the section is you're going to talk in little vignettes about five areas. We were told sort of five by five, five slides, five discussions. So the, 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 the measure of success is the amount of discussion and interaction we promote. Justin, take away. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. It's actually, a, for me, it's a great honour to have Chris uh, speak, uh, introduce me because he actually was my treating physician. Uh, and um, if I fall over through, uh, you know, into crime problems, you know who to blame. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, you got yeah. <laughs> but it, so it, it was quite nice when I saw that Chris was going to introduce uh, introduce me uh, and facilitate this session. So what I want to do today is really this is I'm trying to get. I mean, the idea is, you know, I think. Generally, you think you're going to come and hear something from me. Well, I've come here to get something from you, right? And I want to actually... I'm going to show you a series of technologies that we develop. We don't develop technologies for a given thing. We develop technologies that could be applied to many different things. And so what, I want, uh, what I'm asking you a lot of the time is, is this worthwhile? Can you imagine how this could be used? Or can you imagine how it could be used in another way? I've actually noticed some members of my research group have just attended, just arrived, as per usual, they're five minutes late. Um, but this is the group as a whole as it is at the moment, and uh, I just want to acknowledge all of them um, and all the contribution they make, and I obviously have to acknowledge the funding organisations as well. And so I'm going to just, in one slide, show you what all these people do, because these people do a lot of different things. Um, this is what we do in our group. But there's one thing that is the unifying feature of all this work. And that is that we modify surfaces, <coughs> modify surfaces with a high degree of control, and often that means related to interfacing with biological systems. And so I'm not going to talk, because I was given the title of nanosensors, I thought that meant I wasn't meant to talk about 3D printing, so I won't talk about that today. Uh, but we do 3D printing of, of uh, in vitro models of cancer and high throughput. What I'm going to mostly focus on is these ultra-sensitive sensors, a little bit of electron, uh, electrochemistry microscopy. Most things I talk about today will be electrochemical in nature, but you don't need to worry about that. It's just signal. Um, and we also do a little bit of work on microscopy, look, tracking nanoparticles through cells that move you towards drug delivery, because um, I'm also one of the co-directors with Maria Cavallaris and Cyril Boyer of the Australian Centre for Nanomedicine. But I'm going to mostly focus on sensors. And I'm going to give you four vignettes of about sensors, but I'm going to explain the rationale of what we do and what is the knowledge, what is the gap, the unmet need that we're trying to address. Um, and the three of those four vignettes will relate to that unmet need. And so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. I've, I've given one, two, three, four. That's so and five, so that's so in case you're falling asleep or you're thinking, this one's really boring, you know there's a new number coming in a little, little while longer. And I'm going to talk to you about um, a concept we call dispersible electrodes. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about uh, nanopore sensors that can detect single molecules, so it's based around doing quantitative analysis based on single molecules, so you've got to think about molecular counting. Um, I'm going to talk to you about capture and release of rare cells. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about repurposing the glucose meter, which goes from the... So I start with the incredibly complex. I should say we specialise in complexity. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about very complex uh, systems that give you, we hope, really important information. And I'm going to talk to you in the end about a really pragmatic approach. How can you make that glucose meter useful for other things? 
Um, and so in there, I'm going to talk to you about technologies that can be applied to many different biomarkers. Um, and so, again, I want you to think, well, this might not be... They chose a stupid biomarker. What were they thinking? There must be a bunch of chemists. I want you to think, well, could we apply this to other biomarkers? Is there a biomarker that I'd quite like to have this applied to? So I want you to try and think about the concepts and the capabilities more than the actual thing we detect. Um, think about how could it be useful. And if you think, oh, you know, this would be really good if they applied it to that, then well, throw it out there, let's talk about it, or if, if you don't get the time, let's, let's talk about it later. So that's all I'm going to, you're going to see this slide over and over, but I'm going to tell you about the, the, the philosophy first. So I'm going to relate it to liquid biopsies. It's really all I'm really saying is we're going to sample from blood. I'm only going to focus on in vitro analysis. I'm not going to worry, worry at all about in vivo. Um, I think the reasons for that uh, are, are reasonable in that, you know, if we can do it just by a blood draw or sweat or urine, that would be good. Um, there are times we need in vivo applications, but none of these are targeted towards that. <coughs> but the liquid biopsy has a... Um, I made that joke about most of my research group being five minutes late. They're just walking in there. <laughs> um, the, um, the real key point here, though, is... And I have to sit up the front. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you need to sit up the front so I see you fall asleep. There's a few chairs here. Come on. There's lots and lots. No, they don't, they, they don't sit at the front because they know I spit. <laughs> um, so the key point here with the blood, really, is that if you want to detect a biomarker in the blood that, say, arises from a cancer, the amount of that biomarker is going to be really small. It's going to be really low. And how low? Well, let's say... It's a millimetre tumour. Your 5,000 proteins that are released from that tumour, 5 litres of blood, that means femtomolar. So I'm a chemist. We believe in SI units because they're defined by chemists and therefore we think they must be right. So 5,000. So femtomolar, really, really not, right? So what is that in terms of number of molecules? I, that would be like 100,000 molecules in a mill. So it's a really small amount of stuff. Um, and why is that so important? Well, I don't really need to teach this audience how to suck eggs. Obviously, if you can detect things earlier, you can treat them earlier. Or if you can detect them lower, at lower quantities, you can look at treatment efficacy or at treatment strategies more effectively. And so, is that really an unmet need? So we have these things called biosensors. I think many of you know a... Uh, a biosensor, you all know a glucose meter. There's obviously, a, this is a $16 billion a year industry. Um, this is massive, right? This is one of many on the market. I show this one because it was started by my first PhD student. Really significant com company, actually. Have you ever seen the glucose meter that plugs into the iPhone? Mm -hmm. Same company. The very first biomedical device sold in an Apple store. They, in fact, wrote the Apple policy. Um, but what it is, the, the key point here is you have some sort of transducer, an electrode, could be an optical device in case, this case, it's an electrode, and you have a biological molecule, glucose oxidase. And it's a really simple idea. You want to detect something selectively in biological media, get a biological molecule to do it for you. So you know glucose oxidase will react with beta D glucose and not alpha D glucose. You know, the left hand, not the right hand. Right? That's how selective it is. There's the pregnancy test kits called lateral flow devices. They use antibodies, the other broad successful class of biosensor. Same idea, we use a biological molecule that's selective for the thing we want to detect, and we have some way of generating a signal in this early, early versions of blue bead that then is output into the end user. Now this second one is really key to what I talk about, uh, the philosophy we take in our group. I told you that we don't care about a single biomarker per se, what we're trying to do in our group is design uh, different types of sensors that meet unmet needs, that are conceptual advances in sensing that can be applied to many different things. So the lateral flow device, of course, you change those antibodies, you can change what it detects. And so that's a really important guiding principle. Clearly, we do not need a sensor to tell you whether you're pregnant or not. I think physicians have pretty good ways of knowing that. The reason the, the device exists is because people want it, not because they need it. 
It's also another important caveat when you think about markets. This one, obviously, it revolutionises people's lives, and that's why they want it. So they have it because they want it, not necessarily because they need it. It's a really important concept. But the point here is that we can, if you use antibodies, nucleic acids, peptides, you can take the same ideas and detect other things. And so that's really, remember, what I want you to get out of it. So what's the um? Oh, sorry, this is what I forgot to say. You're actually a really key point. So why do we need other sensors? Why don't we just use these guys? I just told you that the lateral flow device can be applied to many different things. The answer is they can't go low enough. The best this device, obviously this works in, in millimolar ranges for very good reasons. This device maybe can go to micromolar, maybe nanomolar, maybe if you're really stretching it. It's not very quantitative anyway, but the problem is we want to go lower. We want to go femtomolar. We want to meet an unmet need, which is detecting things at lower amounts that can't be done with current technologies. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's really what most of this talk's about. So if you think we've got to go lower, the obvious thing to think, I need a more sensitive detector. And you would be wrong. So here's a nanopore device. Look at the date of the paper, 2000. This device, it's a, it's a, you probably know it as oxid nanopore for, for DNA sequencing, single molecule sequencing. But this device, it's got, an, it's just a, a membrane with two biological, in this case, a biological pore stuck in the membrane, and molecules can go through that pore. We have an electrode on this side, an electrode on that side, and it just measures resistance. When something goes, you think you've got a little hole, you block the hole, the resistance goes up. That's all it is. And it can detect single molecules. We could do that 20 years ago. And it can not only detect single molecules, so here you can see the spikes, right? So each one of these spikes, that's a single molecule going through the pore. So clearly we don't need more sensitive detectors. We can detect single molecules. What we need, and what's the problem then? So if you look at the concentrations here, micromolar, micromolar, micromolar. That's not very useful. I can detect micromolar in lots of really easy ways. Why would I use my super cool nanopore apart from wanting to get into a good journal? Um, and you can see what the problem is. As we go from 28 to 4, you can see the spacing between these spikes gets longer and longer and longer. So if you went to femtomolar, you're waiting 12 minutes between spikes. And so you can say to me, it's not a big problem. You can detect single molecules. Just make the sample smaller. And you could think about doing that. But this I will teach to physicians. In performing analysis, sampling is really important. Because you want your sample to be represented the whole. And so this is a, uh, just a diagram of response curves. It's plus on statistics. One femtomolar is one molecule per nanoliter. Hardly any. And you can see that this is just the confidence, how sure you are that the sample represents the bulk. And this is the volume. And so if I want to detect femtomolar, and I want to be 95% confident it's represented the bulk, I've got to detect 50 nanoliters. I can't make my sample smaller. Because if I make my sample smaller, it won't represent the bulk. So if I have 50 nanoliters and I count single molecules with this technology, I'm waiting 12 hours. So we're nearly not better off, are we? So that's the, that's the challenge. And so here's our solution, and it's a really simple solution. We can detect a single molecule, and here's our five single molecules. They have to hit that sensor, whatever that may be. And remember, the sensor is, in fact, a nanoscale device. Um, and we can detect it, but we may wait the rest of our lives to get the answer. And so our, and the reason it takes a long time is because Moving something, diffusing something through a solution has a squared dependency on distance. So you make it twice as far, it takes four times as long. So that's why it's 12 minutes between molecules. And so our solution is, well, if that's the problem, why don't we just break the sensor up into tiny little bits, tiny little nanoscale balls, and throw them out everywhere? And have them everywhere so nothing has to diffuse very far. And so that's meant to be represented here by these little particles. They're going to now going to capture our red, our red feature. They've got surface chemistry to allow us to selectively capture them. And then, of course, what we do, they're magnetic. So we apply a magnetic field. 
bring it back to the sensor, and we get a faster response and a higher signal. That's the idea. And so that idea we've applied to many different things from proteins to metals to nucleic acids and to organic molecules. And I think that's the end of my first vignette. So it's really framing the problem. So um, I've got a clinical background, so I'm going to throw this, this is the, in the cancer domain. Where do we have this unmet need, David? So, um, I, I think it's likely to be more complex than a single molecule. Correct. It's increasingly the question is could you do multiple different molecules all at the same time to allow complex analysis of whether the That's about to come to the next one, ah, yeah? Right. Sort of, but right. if I haven't addressed it, um, you're absolutely right. It's not only just single molecules, it's often single, uh, not only different types of, different, you know, different nucleic acids, but it might be nucleic acids and proteins. So that's why we develop a technology that we think just by changing antibody or nucleic acid, we can hopefully address that. How do you do it in parallel is a really tough question. Um, and I, if I don't address that by the end of the next vignette, make sure I do it. Because I have an idea on how to do it, um, but it's, um, it's not super easy. But actually it's not super hard either, I don't think. I don't know your name, but just... Um, I Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me think. Let me answer what I think the question was going to be. Um, so, I think that these technologies are often designed to help provide new information, give it quicker, and allow it hopefully to be done. Not necessarily, you know, the idea would be that you'd have a one stop shop. You'd go, you'd see the physician, you'd go and do the analysis, you'd go straight back into the phys physician, because, you know, people coming back is a big cost, or not coming back is a big cost. Um, or, you know, I know that sometimes you go to see your physician and the blood test doesn't come back for whatever reason. So I think that if you can't do it in whole blood and in vitro, it's probably a waste of time, in my view. Um, because what is the competitive advantage, you know? So if I can't do it in whole blood and then get the answer like this, for a nucleic acid, why don't I just do a PCR? Fantastic technology, right? Um, so that's, that would be my argument. So it has to be in the complex sample. I actually am the editor-in-chief of, as of next week when the impact factors come out, the top sensing journal in the world, um, and that's one of the criteria we have. You have to show that it works in the appropriate sample. I think it's reasonable, because otherwise I think we're wasting our time. So is that the answer? Yeah, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. Any quantitative uh, biochemists? Any, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'll, I'll just picture this one. Uh, at, at that nano scale, you're getting a yes or no. But it might not be actually at that lower limit of detection. Your your um, uh, won't be quantitative. But, yeah, it might be quantitative. It's a yes or no, and what information does that give you? Other than so um, the next thing yet will show you that is not necessarily true. Okay, good. It's not a yes or no. Um, it's basically shifting your calibration curve lower. But I will say that I'll show you the third one, we'll show you a technology that is single molecule, so yeah. it could be yes and no, and at this point it's not much better than yes and no, okay. but we, we will get it better than that. Because I think quantitative is needed. So, so the only other thing, and it's another vignette again that's even better, but um, I'm just thinking of something like we were discussing yesterday. It's not necessarily true that uh, the liquid biopsy is going to faithfully reproduce <coughs> what's going on in the tissue of interest. And I'm thinking particularly about in, um, immunological responses, mm -hmm. where measuring the cytokines in the blood is a complete waste of time, mm -hmm. because the action isn't happening there, and it's not reflective. But the problem is accessing the tissue is increasingly becoming 
too difficult or the quality of the tissue is too limited to work on it? Are you going to be talking about beyond liquid and back to... Not tissue? today, but if you go to two people over, Eva here has worked on cytokines with, with uh, Guajian Yu, uh, both biomedical engineering at UNSW. Eva's done a lot of work uh, in vivo as well. Um, I think that, so I would, I would give you an alternative viewpoint, which is not against what you said, but if the market's not big enough, no one's going to make it, right? That's why we have glucose, and it's why we have gene chips. If the markets aren't big enough, no one's going to make it, so it doesn't matter how much you want it. Okay. That's the pragmatic. I think, I think we've predicted a lot of your talk then. Okay, so I'm, I'm off. Thanks very much. <laughs> Lots of documents. Okay, so the first thing, yet yeah, is about these dispersible electrodes. So that's this gold-coated magnetic nanoparticles. I'm just going to show you one example. I showed you back here. I said there's four. Um, I said we there's four types of analytes. I'm going to show you the nucleic acids. And um, and so there's my fancy little bit of graphics. So I'm pretty proud of that. So you need to suck it, soak it up. No, not suck it up, soak it up. Um, so microRNA. So microRNA is one of those. And actually, you know, when I say you have to be commercially viable to uh, the other problem, of course, it has to be FDA approved biomarker. Does anyone know how many biomarkers get FDA approval a year? 1.5. So if it's not approved, you're almost wasting your time. So I've just told you I'm wasting my time. But I think that the other thing I will say, actually, on these sensors, we get too locked up on the commercial uh, imperative. What we, a lot of people do is develop really beautiful measurement technologies, I'd like to think we do that, that may never be able to be commercialised because the markets aren't big enough, and so then people stop. But what you've developed is great discovery tools, and so I think we should never forget that, and so this is actually one of the areas we're using this technology. <coughs> so you all know about microRNAs. The thing about microRNAs, so there's you know, 19 to 25 base pair long, bits of RNA that are post-transcriptional regulators, they float around the bloodstream, um, and they're stable in the bloodstream. Only because they're inside extracellular vesicles, exosomes most frequently. And so, from an analytical perspective of, you know, something that you can access from the blood and measure, microRNAs are there. And the thing about microRNAs, and that comes back to the multiplexing, um, is that they're uh, they can be up or down regulated with different pathologies. And so you can't just measure one. But the measurement challenge is enormous because they're found in the femtomolar to picomolar range. And so they might be picomolar or femtomolar and down regulated or up regulated. So you need to be able to measure outside that range. So it's a really tough challenge, sort of thing that I'm stupid enough to try and solve. And so we take our magnetic nanoparticles and we coat them, so they're gold-coated magnetic nanoparticles. I didn't tell you why they're gold. It's because we like gold. No, it's because gold's conducting, and gold is really easy to modify with chemistry. And then we want to make these electrodes. Magnetic nanoparticles are not conducting. They'll only, uh, pass, you know, they'll only insulate your electron. So we modify the part gold-coated magnetic nanoparticles with a sequence of DNA. Unfortunately, the project is scrambled it a little bit, but you don't want to know what it is anyway. It's a radox active molecule. A molecule can oxidise and reduce. A molecule you can get a current from. So it's just a single strand of DNA sitting with a, with a, with a, a label on it, and those particles now float around in solution. And they can bind with target microRNAs in our blood sample. We have to lyse our exosomes, but otherwise they're in the blood sample. And if that, that target is found, it then forms a duplex. An RNA-DNA duplex. So, a single strand of DNA is floppy. It just flops around everywhere. It's got a persistence length of three base pairs. A duplex has, typically has a persistence length of 50 nanometers, so a lot of base pairs. So it's a rigid rod on this end. And so that means that these little blue dots here represent that molecule. That means, because it's floppy, they can access the particle and they can give us a current once we connect them. If they're a rigid rod, they can't. This distance is too far for electron transfer. And so we collect our sample, we use a magnet, we bring it back and we measure electrochemistry. And so this is the So you can see here's just 
no, nothing captured, you get one big peak. Something's captured, you get a small peak. Is it any good? Well, when we did it in Buffer, we thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Look, it's amazing how low we can get. We can get down to 10 atomolar. Now, actually, we can get down to 1 atomolar. But 10 atomolar, to put it in context, that's 12,000 molecules. That's all we're detecting. And I thought, this is really cool. And we spent a lot of time trying to understand the mechanism. We think we understand it. And then I thought, well, let's, let's be stupid. Let's try putting it in serum. Because it will fail, then we can do something else. And it didn't fail. So that's PBS, um, so buffer, that's serum. We could do it in blood. We couldn't do it in whole blood. That's too viscous. But we have to lyse the exosomes. So we lyse the exosomes anyway with the lysis buffer. So it's 50% blood. We can still measure. We still have a detection limit down there. So we can actually do measurements of really small amounts of these microRNAs in essentially just blood. So came back to Phoebe's question. So really, can you actually get reliable information? So that's again, you know, just spiked it. So then we took some cells, non-small cell um, lung cancer cells, A549s. We could isolate the exosomes. We could lyse them. We could measure them with the sensor in buffer or serum. You can see pretty much the same response. We could compare them to quantitative PCR, um, where you obviously have to have the, here, obviously, the more analyte, the bigger the signal change. Here, the more the analyte, the less number of cycles to get a certain response. And we can quantify those and say we get the same response. So that's not just spiked RNA in, um, in blood or serum. It's taking the extract from the cells, from the exosomes, all the RNA, and just dumping it in there and seeing whether it protects it. And it can. Again, very surprising. Um, and so then, being really silly or brave, we talked to Maria and we did animal models, Maria and Josh, um, and um, so we took three control mice, three mice that had an um, a, a orthotopic cancer model, took the blood out, measured the blood, and the sensor could tell the difference between the, the mice with cancer and the mice without cancer, and we could do it also by quantitative PCR, where we had a housekeeping sequence in there just to make sure our extractions are are appropriate, and we get the same sort of answer. Except we're doing it in blood, not, not purified extract. We're taking 30 minutes, not 12 hours. Um, and so it does look like it works in a really complex sample. So how do we multiplex that? That's actually really difficult. But we now can make microtiter plates, that each microtiter plate is an electrode. And so now you can put different particles in different one, and, put it, and you now have instruments that you can just read them all out. So that's how I, I think that's the simplest way to multiplex. And now, of course, you can look at quite a few sequences. All you've got to do is change the sequence of DNA on the particle, and you'll detect a different microRNA sequence. You could also change it to an antibody and detect a protein marker. We haven't done that yet. Actually, um, that's one of the things we're, we're looking at now, we're just starting to think about now. Sharma, who's followed this work on, is actually just pricing the instruments for me, um, and then we will, we will try to see if we can do multiplexing. So that would be the end of the second vignette. Excellent. Does that stimulate any questions? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, so, in terms of obviously sequence specific, <coughs> good signal to noise, um, protein antibody, okay, you, know, you can get messy antibodies that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Antibody is the bane of our existence, yeah. actually. I mean, what's the limit? You know, I mean, obviously, if you're looking at your acids, you know, it's pretty, pretty good to get a nice sensitive sequence-specific um, bond. Uh, maybe even use lots of nucleic acids or one of those sort of yeah. technologies. But, you know, you had organic um, into, uh, metabolites and metabolomics, mm -hmm. where, you know, you're really at the moment relying on mass spec to be able to, you know, look at differences in, in a lot of different so, I mean, do you see there being a limit in the applications to really protein based and, and maybe? Yeah, I, I would venture to say that I think uh, small molecules, really difficult. Um, also, don't know what the imperative is over mass spec, where you get so much depth of information. Um, also, we have shown that we can do small molecules. That was a tricky experiment. I'm not sure how robust that would be. I wouldn't, I think.